Hello, welcome to the Friday, July 10th, 2020 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Yesterday, I mentioned how the Citrix vulnerabilities became somewhat more important because Donnie Masland did publish a blog post with additional details about how to exploit these vulnerabilities. Well, it turns out that this morning, our honeypots did see a scan from actually only a very small number of sources, but they were scanning for two of the vulnerabilities, one that can be used to read arbitrary files and a second one that does retrieve a PCI DSS compliance document without authentication. Now, the file that these exploit attempts uh, retrieved was Etsy password. Etsy password, of course, does not contain any passwords, but usernames. I really rank this more sort of as a reconnaissance scan, where someone is just checking whether or not these systems are vulnerable. Our honeypots actually were still configured to act as F5 big IP devices, so they just responded with 404 errors to these requests. And talking about F5 big IP, one configuration change I made to our honeypots this morning was to configure them to be essentially patched systems with the workaround applied. So they also returned 404 errors to uh, these uh, exploit attempts for the F5 vulnerabilities. I didn't uh, see any query that would try to bypass uh, the workaround. So that may still be fairly rare and uh, not something the internet is sort of scanned for at large. Now, in an added development to the Citrix vulnerability, Donny Mosland also now published a YouTube video showing how the cross-site scripting vulnerability that had been patched by Citrix can be leveraged to get full remote code execution. Now, there isn't a lot of detail. It's really just a video demo without showing any of the underlying code other than sort of a couple of hints as to, for example, what error messages are are coming back. This particular vulnerability would be exploited by tricking an administrator to visit a website that would then exploit the cross-site scripting vulnerability. The administrator has to be logged in to the Citrix device in order for this to work, if I understand the video correctly. So in short, keep patching Citrix F5 and don't forget, Palo Alto's systems that were also patched this week. Not a lot of detail about that particular issue yet. Juniper also released updates today. Didn't see anything sort of outrageously critical yet, uh, but haven't had a chance to look at them in detail. And Google gave us all a nice gift with all these vulnerabilities that we keep talking about, the Tsunami Security Scanner. This is a vulnerability scanner that Google built internally for its network. And well, if it's good enough for Google's network, it'll probably work for your network too. It's sort of your classic security scanner. It starts out with a port scan and some fingerprinting, but then also does things like, for example, detect uh, exposed admin UIs. That was, of course, a big one uh, this week. Also, uh, weak credentials, remote code execution, and then a bunch of other plugins that are available as part of the package. There's sort of a separate GitHub repository for them that you can load into Tsunami as you need them. Ever since Nessus sort of went more commercial, there has really been a gap in nice, scalable vulnerability scanners that are open source. So we'll see if Tsunami can fill that gap. All the feedback I've heard so far is pretty positive. Well, and it's Friday again, and of course, I do have another STI student to talk about a research paper. Billy, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure. So, as you said, my name is Billy Wilson. I work at Brigham Young University as a high-performance computing systems administrator who works with cybersecurity professionals. And I've been working in HPC, or supercomputing is kind of the colloquial term, for about six years now. 
your paper obviously was about uh, supercomputing, high performance computing. Uh, can you tell a little bit about uh, what aspect uh, you talked about in your paper? Yeah. So I first became interested in the subject, uh, which focuses on performance monitoring and security monitoring for Linux uh, about four or five years ago. I had gone to a conference in Maryland about high performance computing security. And I thought, being relatively new, that I'd learned from all these brilliant scientists and engineers all the best practices for how to monitor the compute nodes, the servers responsible for the actual computations, without degrading performance. And to my disappointment, I learned that this was still an unsolved problem, that people were still trying to figure out how to monitor a supercomputer without degrading performance. Uh, part of why that's important is when you're talking about percentages, you know, 1% performance loss sounds really small. But in high performance computing, if someone's running a simulation that lasts for three weeks, 1% can mean several hours, five or six hours. And that type of loss of time can actually result in simulations failing and them having to either start over or go back to a checkpoint. Uh, as I was trying to solve this, I found out that some big players like Netflix and Facebook and Google had been developing some new features in the Linux kernel to solve this kind of problem. So my research looked into what they were doing and what tools they developed that security practitioners could use. Yeah, so that's interesting. And I guess another way to put it is, you know, these high performance computing uh, setups, uh, they cost like you know, millions of dollars. So uh, a few percent of that is still significant money in some ways. You focused on network monitoring or in your paper. Uh, can you explain a little bit some of those kernel hooks and such that you used that it came in handy when you tried to do network monitoring in this type of environment? Yeah, absolutely. And what's interesting is uh, Berkeley Packet Filter has really evolved over the last several years. It's not just a network uh, packet filtering tool anymore. It's now a system-wide tracing subsystem of Linux, meaning that you can use BPF for tracing system calls, for doing arbitrary tracing on user space libraries. And so I wrote and modified some existing tools, some existing scripts using uh, BPF Trace, a recently created uh, tool that's a lot like awk. And the things I monitored included DNS queries. Instead of looking at the network packets or looking what's on the wire, what these traces did is they attached probes to the GNU C library. And any user space executables generally are going to go through the C library when they're making system calls. And when I traced particular functions in the GNU C library using BPF trace, I was able to see what host names were being queried at the endpoint instead of looking on the wire. This was useful for a few reasons. One is in HPC, there's just a lot of data on the wire. We have InfiniBand instead of just Ethernet. And an InfiniBand cable is... 56 for our FDR, for our speed of InfiniBand, it's 56 gigabits a second for a single compute node. So when you aggregate all the different compute nodes, we're talking about terabytes of data per second. And that's just too much for typical uh, sniffing tools and those type of architectures. So to move it to the endpoint, when you're looking at this from the endpoint perspective, the GNU C library and tracing that, you can see more without affecting performance. Yeah, so essentially what it comes down to is you have uh, this um, huge amount of traffic on the network. You probably would need a second supercomputer just to sort of analyze all that traffic. But most of the traffic is you know, HPC traffic. It's not um, DNS traffic. So by tying in with the DNS library, you really only have to analyze something whenever there is an actual DNS query being sent uh, by the machine. I assume... There are typically not a lot of DNS queries sent by these uh, computers, sir. Correct. The compute nodes often are isolated from the internet. So if you see a DNS query coming from a compute node, that's not usually normal, usually. Although there is certainly scientific software that behaves in ways that administrators don't expect. Some other interesting traces that we put on these compute nodes included 
tracing libraries to see when someone tried to escalate to root, which is not very common on the compute nodes. I wrote some tracing scripts that also looked for SSH proxies. Because what might happen is a compute node, if they can connect to another computer or another server in the environment, and that one has internet access, a user could potentially try to create an SSH proxy through it to reach the internet. So we also wrote some tracing scripts that detected whenever an SSH client tried to start an SSH proxy. And in addition to that, we also had a final trace that would look for any external connections. Compute nodes should talk to each other, but not outside of that environment. So using the BPF trace tool, we generated logs that per event, instead of polling for events like a lot of, or polling for, for data, like a lot of Linux tools like Top or Netstat, where you just get a snapshot the moment you run it, these BPF tracing tools will give you, at the time of the event, a log that's cut with what happened. And I guess an advantage you have here is that these type of systems also have fairly specific workloads or such, or that makes them a bit easier uh, to manage or a little bit easier uh, to spot anomalies, like you mentioned, these outbound connections? In some ways, yes. Uh, in other ways, it's actually can be difficult to say what behavior is good for scientific software. A lot of these sites service not just their own users, but they, they work together for collaborators that may run scientific software from many different disciplines, whether it's life sciences, or engineering, or astronomy. And a lot of researchers also develop the tools on the supercomputer. So you might see difference not just between different pieces of software, but the same piece of software might change behavior over time as it's developed. And so you have to be very precise in writing traces that are very specific to behavior you, don't, you know that you don't want. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of noise. And also a little bit targeting sort of typical exploit activity. I would assume not being really in that field myself, but that uh, probably SSH daemon is sort of one of your big entry points here for an attacker. Uh, maybe people then trying to either steal secrets or uh, maybe even run something like a crypto coin miner on that machine. Yeah, and speaking to the amount of power that is being used on these supercomputers, if you get a cryptocurrency miner in there, that's going to waste a lot of time and money for those that administer the supercomputer. Now, any problems uh, with sort of affecting the software that's running on these supercomputers? You mentioned performance, where like a drop in performance can sometimes sort of cause things to fail. Uh, any other things that you sort of had to be careful about uh, to not interfere with the actual purpose of uh, the computer? The biggest thing is just having very precise traces. There were a few issues where a trace, for example, intending to see DNS hostname lookups or simply hostname lookups, they, they would catch more activity than expected. For example, looking for hostname resolution, but then seeing that any Etsy host lookups, including local hosts, end up getting caught. So a lot of the battle is just making it precise enough. There was discussion from Brendan Gregg, who wrote an amazing book on these tools. He's the senior performance architect at Netflix. He talked about when he tried to trace, for example, Malik or Free, that he was seeing performance loss upwards of 10x. So you got to be really careful to, to pick the right places. Well, uh, that's really great. So I'm looking forward uh, to your uh, next uh, paper. Maybe we'll have you again here. Thanks uh, for joining me here. Thank you very much. And that's it uh, for today. Thanks again for listening. Talk to you again on Monday. Bye.